I'm Mary Curie. Um, uh, I was delighted when uh, I was told that they were going to do a Mount St. Lawrence Cemetery because uh, in the 1980s my dad read Art Graveyard. Um, he approached it quite differently because at the time there was no computers. Um, a friend of his was working in Ordnance Survey Ireland and provided him with a map, which you see here, um, an aerial photograph of the graveyard. And from this, he drew up a map. And then using that map, funny enough, he started at the southeast side, which is what historic graves say you should do. And um, so he started there and he worked along in rows. So he pretty much did it as historic graves do. However, the difference was that he only recorded gravestones that had inscriptions. So he didn't look at metal crosses or a tomb if it hadn't an inscription or a headstone if it had no inscription, he didn't count it. So he only counted something that was inscribed. Um, yeah, go on. So this is what went on to the survey in 1981. Uh, the headstone inscriptions, the notes, uh, basically the notes he put in were any historic notes that he knew about the families and he had a, a set way of looking at it. He looked at the tide deployments in 1838 uh, Griffith's valuation in um, 1858, and then the 1901 and the 1911 census. If he didn't know something about a family, he generally asked around, tried to find out what people knew. But some of the headstones, um, he just knew nothing about, so they just left blank. Uh, it took about three or four years to get all this down, and then he sent it off to Thomond Archaeological to Etienne Rin, and Etienne Rin said it was excellent and sent it back to him and said, could you just tweak it a little bit? How about an index? How about an index of names? How about stone cutters? And this kind of went on and back for the next 10 years. <laughs> okay. And I remember this really, really well because I was the muggins who typed it. <laughs> These are the days when there was no computing and there was no tipex. And if you wanted a copy, you put carbon at the back and you made sure you turned it the right way around. <laughs> and you typed and retyped. And if Etienne Wren sent it back and said, you're missing a line here, you then had to type the other 65 pages because he put every other page out. So it was, I knew some sections of it off by heart. Um, the notes were excellent. And really, if you read the whole thing, it's only 65 pages long, you've got a potted history of Arda. And so the notes really make it. Some of it is just fairly dry stuff, maybe saying who owned the land in the whatever the census. But the better bits are where he's actually got stories, and he's put in the stories of you know the Fenian uprising, finding the Arda chalice, William Smith O'Brien, all the things that kind of put an Arda on the map, if you like. So then we move on to Mount St. Lawrence graveyard, and uh, I was just interested to see how different this is going to be, how things had moved on from when my dad did it. And basically, this, they started the same way. They started with a map, they started by numbering the stones, but then health and safety was a big issue, something we never even thought about in 1980. <laughs> uh, recording, they recorded everything, literally everything, uh, metals, buried stones, um, metal crosses, inscriptions, the design, the size, the shape, the width. It was amazing how detailed it was. And then devotional items, lichens, and then any notes we could get. But the brilliant bit is that it's digitally recorded. So then when you wanted to actually look up and analyze your figures. You could go onto the spreadsheet and use the filter button. I don't know who invented the filter button, but it's magic. <laughs> I remember in 1981 doing the indexes with Jerry, and it took us weeks when all the A's, all the B's, all the C's, trying to get them into the right order. And now a filter button just does it for you like that. It's, I mean, teenagers don't realize <laughs> how incredibly lucky they are. Okay, so Arda Graveyard, then I decided I would carry on from Mount St. Lawrence. It was such a, a positive experience that I'd like to do my final year project and look at Arda Graveyard again. But this time, I wasn't looking at the history so much. I decided to try and collect all the information that we'd got from Mount St. Lawrence, use the same spreadsheet that we used in there, but use it for Arda. Uh, when my dad did it in 80, 1981, um, there were only 181 gravestones. And then in 1972, a new cemetery had opened in Arda. So I thought, there wouldn't be a whole lot extra in there. I thought maybe another 10 or 20 at the most. Uh, so I didn't think it was going to be a huge task because I was going to reference his stuff a lot. <laughs> um, okay, so I used the same map that he used and then I just mapped on all the extra stones and I was a bit shocked to find that there was actually now 293, so it was 100 extra. So a lot more work than I envisaged. <laughs> oh, whoops, sorry, click the wrong one here. Okay, so once I'd got the whole, I, sorry, oh, it's gone back. Uh, can I? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
<laughs> okay, anyway, I'll just continue on talking. Suddenly, I, I allowed myself three weeks to do this because I thought there's about 200 stones there, and I thought if I do 10 a day, I won't kill myself. I'll read 10 a day, go home, put them on the spreadsheet, and then I'll move on. And I thought, I'll have that done in three weeks, no problem. And the weather was fantastic. Sunshine every day, it was a really nice time. However, what I didn't counter on was the fact that a lot of locals saw me, and because I'm local, they knew me, and they'd come over and say, Mary, what are you doing? <laughs> and then I'd say, I was you know, interested in gravestones and recording them, and said, do you know, my mother's buried here, but my father's buried in Kilbraithen. Let me tell you about that. And on and on, and you know, I'd say, go away. <laughs> Which you can't very much. <laughs> okay, so anyway, at the end of six weeks it took, in fact, not three weeks. So at the end of six weeks, I suddenly had all this information, and I thought, "Why am I going to do with it all? Because the history's already been recorded. So I looked at the history of the graveyard itself, not the individual plots. In the second section, I looked at the iconography, because the, the designs of some of them are just stunning, and you couldn't help but be interested. And if you're interested in the iconography, then you have to wonder who made it. So I looked at the stone cutters also. So let me just click. Down. Oh, the arrows. Oh, thank you. Right. So this is what I found in Arda Graveyard. Um, basically, the majority of them are headstones. 50% are headstones. That's the pale pink ones. Uh, cross headstones are just headstones with a cross on top. Celtic crosses, which are here, the arches. Um, you can see the that one's very early, but the rest of them fall in between uh, 1890s and 1913. Slab ledgers are the earliest. Um, this one here, 1759 is uh, Bishop of Limerick, Bishop Lacey, and he's put into the burial, the, the Lacey tomb. Uh, we wouldn't really know what the inscription was, except that it's in Begley's history, because it's completely worn away. You can't read it anymore. And you can see that they only last from 1750 to 1820, which is roughly similar as the dates given by Chapel for Galway. He says uh, 1760 to, I think, 1860. But it's a bit later than Dr. Mighton says for Monaghan, he says 1710 to 1790. So it would be interesting, eventually, when Historic Graves has mapped all the graves in Ireland, to see if there is some sort of pattern of where the slab ledgers originated from, and as the distance decay comes, you know, to see the dates. Anyway, when they kind of die out, if you like, uh, we've only got plaques and other things that come. Plaques seem a fairly modern thing. There's one here, there's a wall plaque, it's quite old, but all the rest are quite late, coming in last. 1940. Um, there are three heart-shaped ones. One is two are for children and one is for an uncle, but all the rest are either for first cousins or distant relations, you know? They're not kind of, if you like, direct family members. Um, and here there's one little red one there, that's a statue, and there's one obelisk. The obelisk is to a fenian. Um, the other thing to notice are there are dips and falls, and basically more headstones are put up when people have money. So when you see a lot of headstones, you can tell the economy is doing well. Uh, when there's drops, you can see things are not so good. So here, in the 1840s, obviously, only four headstones went up in that entire time, and one of those was in 1847. Uh, this is one thing I missed. Uh, I was at a funeral recently, and I was standing beside an old boy, and when we'd finished talking about the deceased and the weather, I looked down at that, and I said, I suppose that went in when the grave the, the path went in, and he's, his name's John Joe Kennelly, and he said, no, he said, I put that in. He said, that's uh, to commemorate my two uncles who are stillborn. And uh, this is at the northeast gate into the graveyard. And actually, when John Tierney was giving his talk, he said, that's where unburied ba or unbaptized babies are usually buried. So I imagine there are more than just John Joe's two uncles in there. Um, when I was looking at iconography, the one thing that really grabbed me were representation of angels, and this is one of the earliest ones. It's very crude. Uh, I think it's meant to be scary, so that you're probably worried about doom and gloom. However, there is um, also symbols of resurrection and constellation, the stars on the outside, so there's some hope for redemption as well. Uh, in this one here, you can see there at the top, you kind of got what I call angry angels. There's these scowling angels. And on the right and the left, we've got St. Michael and uh, St. Gabriel, the archangels. They're wearing these kind of little peaky caps. You can see those just there. And um, 
I think is it Murphy says, that suggests that in the 1830s, the British Army wore those kind of peaky caps, and they're probably just copied from what the British Army were wearing at the time. And that stone dates to, you can see there, 1835. Uh, this one is unusual in that the archangels here on the right and the left are wearing masks. And Rowe suggests that masks were considered um, a symbol of evil or something. So you wonder why they would put a mask onto an archangel. It's just one of those queer quandaries. But what I like about this is the central is circular. And the crucifix is kind of like a Maltese cross. It's almost like um, an axe head. You know, the very s and then it tapers down very finely onto the IHS, and there's a tiny little heart under the feet there. So it's a beautifully done piece of work. And again, this one, this is the one that was put up in 1847, uh, put up by Mr. Condon for his two sons who were killed, or who died, rather, of the black fever, it was called, locally. And my dad was talking to an extra neighbor who would be a direct descendant of one of the daughters, Condon's daughter, who married Sheehan. And he was saying how tragic it was to lose two sons in the famine. And the next door neighbor said, the real tragedy was they lost the farm. Because he only had two sons. Uh, he had three daughters. The eldest daughter had already married Sheehan, so the farm was divided between the remaining two daughters, and they married Drenan and uh, Barry, and those two families are still in the village. But anyway, what's interesting about this is the amount of iconography on it. If you start at the top, you've got IHS and the cross, then the Lamb of God in the very center, and Ecce Agnes Dei. But then it's got uh, six angels, uh, four angry ones, two there, two here, and then the two archangels here and here. And then finally, there's another two crosses, and this one is signed J. O. Callahan. And again, unusual, it's got this central circular bit there in the center. Okay, so it's just very unusual. I can only assume that he was so upset and distraught at losing his two sons that he, he just spent a huge amount of money on getting this headstone. Okay, next one. This is the finest one in depicting angels. It looks like a line drawing, and you can see just beautifully drawn. If you see how much detail goes into the little feet, and you can see each of the little toes even. So it's a very, very pretty one. It's uh, erected by Thomas Dalton for his parents, and then also Thomas Dalton, and it says at the bottom, ye above, which I think indicates that the headstone cutter is also buried in there. Okay. Next one from all right, stone cutters. I won't read all of this. Uh, basically, there are 26 different ones uh, over all the stones that we looked at. Only 85 are signed. Uh, 17 of the 23 Celtic crosses, and that's the other ones also. There are headstones with stone cutters' names on them. And these are all the different ones. You can see the majority of them are from County Limerick. Uh, the two major areas are Newcastle West, Boynes, and the city. Coffey and Horn would be the two major ones. Uh, one from Kerry, Finucan, two from North Cork. The village of Meelan seemingly was a great stone cutting area. If you read the book Stone Mad by Murphy, he gives over a whole chapter to it. Uh, but there was a final one from Kilkenny and Callan called O'Shea. That seems a long way to go for a stone cutter if you're living in Arda. Uh, and to be honest, when I did my FYP, I wasn't bothered looking it up because he's so far away. But my mentor put beside it, more information, please. So I thought, <laughs> I, be <laughs> I better look it up. And uh, luckily I did because I found out that this guy uh, was actually nationally famous. His name was John O'Shea. He had a brother, James, and a nephew. And they were working on Kildare Street Club, and they were doing very fine work, carving little monkeys playing billiards outside a club next to uh, what's now Dáil Éireann. And they were spotted by John Ruskin. He was over in 1857 attending a series of lectures on TCD. He saw these uh, men carving, and he thought, isn't this wonderful Irish natural artists away from industrialization and mass production that was going on in England? And he invited them back to England to carve uh, the front or the facade of the Oxford Museum of Natural History. And they went there, but unfortunately it went to his head and uh, he became unbearable to work with, the architect at the time said. And he had a falling out with the convocation so that he carved their faces onto parrots and owls <laughs> on the front. <laughs> so it didn't end very happily. He, <laughs> he then returned to Ireland and he set up a stone carving business, carving Celtic crosses in Kilkenny and Callan. Uh, as that was 1857, his son took over from him in due time, and uh, it was this Celtic cross 
get this right, there we go. Uh, it's very plain, it's one of the plainest Celtic crosses in the graveyard. It's got just a little cross on each of the bosses and just kind of a little ribbon with by will be done and very simple little shamrocks. So it's very understated. So why he went, it's just interesting to think about it for a minute, to come from Kilkenny and Callan. I guess they came down on train, maybe came down separate pieces and boxes, came to Limerick Station, back out to Arda Station, and then they'd collect it from the station and reassemble it. You know, just, that was a lot of work. <laughs> and for such a simple effect at the end. So surprising. Okay. So the good news is from this, having had the training at uh, Mount St. Lawrence and having done Arda Graveyard and had a successful experience that hopefully now this summer I'm going to work with uh, Mike Mulcahy, I think you might know. Uh, he's going to do the photography for me and we're going on to do uh, another two graveyards locally. Uh, so it's been a very successful venture basically. <laughs> Thank you.